Before we get started in, let's, let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to open up your word before us. And Father, help us to have it to be applied to our heart and our life, that we would not simply be people who hear a story, but to learn from its meaning and have that change our lives dramatically. And Father, I ask you to continue to watch over all those who will be graduating, all those who have graduated, continue to give them the strength and the guidance that they need and the decisions that they must make as life moves forward. Father, we pray that life moves forward. We pray for long, healthy, happy lives for these graduates. And I ask you to watch over them and watch over this congregation as we live for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, turn to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 17. Now, some of you won't even need to actually turn to this chapter because you know this chapter. Actually, probably everybody in this room right now has heard this story. It's the story of David and Goliath. It contains one of the most familiar stories of the Bible that we all know. But as it has been said, sometimes familiarity breeds contempt. In this case, I think sometimes familiarity breeds misunderstanding. The story of David and Goliath is a story that we've all heard. We've heard this story since our youth. The story in its childhood retellings, sometimes it escapes our notice. But stories like this, they're important to us because they teach us about who we are more than anything else, about who God is and how God interacts with his people. But once you hear those names, David and Goliath, the story takes on a life of its own. Images pop in our mind and connotations about what we've heard and what we've read of this very thing taking place. You've got a little shepherd boy versus a giant from Gath. And we think about this, and we think about often obstacles standing in our way which we must slay. But when we tell children this story, we try to bring it down to the simplest explanation that we can. But when we do that, we miss something. It's not quite the story of the Bible. The story is not simply about giants in our lives. No, the story is a, a celebration and an illustration of the power of God. And so setting the stage for the ultimate battle scene is very important. Saul has taken the armies of Israel to the valley of Elah. You have the Philistines encamped on one mountain and the Israelites camped on another and the valley or ravine between the two. They're ready for war. They're all in their battle attire. And out from the Philistine camp comes the giant. The giant from Gath named Goliath. He steps forth and he taunts the Israelites. He looks at them. He is in all of his battle array. He's got a sword, a spear, a javelin. He's got a coat of bronze shekels that weighs 125 pounds. He's got a man walking before him holding a shield to stop an attack. And he looks at the Israelites and says... Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you the servant of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he can fight with me and kill me, we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, you shall be our servants 
and serve us. Goliath continues to open his big mouth and he says, I defy this day the armies of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. And Saul and all the Israelites, they're terrified. Meanwhile, David's not even there. Did you know that? Because when we tell this story, what do we do? We go straight to the battle. We go straight to David versus Goliath. But you have to understand, David wasn't part of the army. Now David is not a soldier. David is a shepherd. He is at home in Bethlehem with his father Jesse, tending Jesse's flocks. And Jesse sends David with provisions to his older brothers who are on the front line. Yes, David's been going back and forth. Remember, he is with Saul at times, soothing Saul's spirit by playing hymns. But he's gone back home. And now he's going to take provisions on the request of his dad to his older brothers. And so he gets a good night's rest and he goes out the next morning and he goes to the battlefield. But what he's supposed to do is this. He's supposed to take the supplies to the supply holder and find out how his brothers are doing, and then he's supposed to just go back home. But David doesn't do that. No, what David does is David sees the armies of Israel going out to battle, and he wants in on battle. See, David is a young man who's sometimes hot-headed and spoiling for a fight. He sees these armies of Israel going out, and he wants to be part of the battle too. He wants in on the action. Going to see his brothers, well, that's just an excuse. David should not have been there. But while he's there, he hears Goliath taunting the armies of Israel. He must have heard Goliath say, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man, and we will fight together. David probably thought himself, hey, I'm that man. I'm the one that's going to take care of this situation. See, young men often like to prove themselves. And this was David's opportunity. David heard Goliath. But David also heard the people in the camp talking. The Israelite soldiers speaking with one another about things that had been said. Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and will give his father's household exemption from taxes in Israel. Riches and glory to the one who slays the giant. As if the temptation of battle wasn't enough. Now... We have the temptation of battle and riches and honor and glory. This is too great a temptation for a young man to pass up. David can't believe it. He asks again, all those people gathered around him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine that takes away the reproach of Israel? For this is this uncircumcised Philistine who is he that he would defy the armies of the living God? And the man answered David, and they said, Well, so it shall be for the man who kills him. David's older brother, Eliab, he overhears David talking about all the things that are going on, and he gets angry at David. Why did you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down here to see battle. 
Eliab knows his brother. He knows why David is there. He knows what's in David's heart. But David pops back and he says, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then David turns away from his brother and goes back to asking the men around him what's going to happen for this man who kills the Philistine giant. Don't misunderstand, David is a man after God's own heart. But David had issues. And even right here we start to see a glimpse of who David really is and what he might fall into later. David, he's not keeping a low profile in the camp. Word gets around that there's a young man running his mouth about Goliath and the reward for killing him. And someone goes and tells Saul, and Saul wants to see him. You would think that Saul would just tell this little guy, keep your mouth shut, go back home, but that's not what Saul does. Saul doesn't seem to be thinking clearly. I mean, perhaps fear has gripped him to such an extent that he's willing to do whatever it takes, including sending this little shepherd boy to fight his battle. But the battle's not Saul's. Really, the battle's not David's. The battle is the Lord's. David is bold. He says to Saul and all those gathered there, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go out and fight this Philistine. And so Saul should be the one actually telling his army that. But instead Saul warns David. I don't think he ultimately believes David could do this. He knows that David won't be able to fight Goliath. David is a little boy. And this giant, he's a man. He's a man of war. He's been battling since his youth. But David, he's determined. He's determined to fight. And David knows he can do this. He explains to Saul and those gathered there how often a bear or a lion would come and he would take one of the sheep that David was watching after and he would bite it up and grab it off and take it away and David would track the animal down, take the sheep from his mouth and kill the bear or the lion. David says, your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. And David continues and he says, Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear? He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David's plea is passionate. And Saul lets him go. Saul does warn him, but Saul bids him the Lord's presence. Saul gives him his armor, which does not fit. Saul's a fully grown man, head and shoulders above the rest in Israel. David is a little shepherd boy. How would it be that Saul's armor would fit David? It won't. It will just slow him down, encumber him. So he puts it off. So Saul, then he tries to give him his sword. But that's not David's weapon of choice. David puts off the armor, he drops the sword, he goes down to the brook, and he picks up five smooth stones, and puts them in his bag. He walks back up to the front line, to the line of battle. With a sling and the stones in hand, he is ready for battle. Goliath comes out and walks toward David. David walks toward Goliath and the stage is set. The battle is on. Goliath looks at David, this handsome young shepherd boy, ruddy and athletic. Goliath has disdain for David. Perhaps the giant doesn't want to be one at all. Maybe he thought, well, if I would have been born a young, athletic, handsome shepherd boy, I would not have the life I had. But he is a giant. 
And there's no chance of change for him. Goliath continues to taunt David. He curses David in the name of the Philistine gods. And the last thing that Goliath said was, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. If he knew that's the last thing he was going to say, he might have chose some different words. But then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so it was. And the Philistine. The giant Goliath, he arose and came and drew near to meet David. And David hurried and ran toward him and the armies of the Philistines. David reached his hand into the bag, pulled out a stone, slung it, and struck the forehead of Goliath. And the stone sunk into the forehead of Goliath, and Goliath fell to the earth face first. David runs and prevails over the Philistines with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine and took the Philistine's sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head. And when all the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The battle was won. The Israelites... Now emboldened, they run after the armies of the Philistines, which are in full retreat. David takes the head of the Goliath, and he takes it to Jerusalem, and Goliath's armor underneath David's tent. And Saul saw all of this taking place, playing out, and he was astonished. He looked at Abner, who was the commander of the armies of Israel, and says, Whose boy is this? Abner didn't know. David's not a soldier. David's a shepherd. The commander of the armies of Israel would not have known who David was. But David comes to Saul, and Saul asks him, Whose son are you, young man? And David replies, I'm the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. The battle had been won. David, Saul, and the Israelites were victorious. However, did we miss something? Is that it? Is it really just that simple? I want to just give you some interesting observations from the story. Because usually David, and rightfully so, is the main focal point of the story. The battle is a defining moment in David's life. The showdown will be the event that causes Saul to resent and even try to kill David. David looks like the hero in contrast to Saul. Saul should have been the one out in front of his armies. Saul should have been the one who took down Goliath. But no, David was the hero. And the hero gets the reward. The armies of Israel, they were in fear of this Philistine giant. When Goliath had no equal on the other side, the one man, Saul, who was head and shoulders above the rest, is standing behind his army. And Saul was not instilling confidence. He was just as fearful as everybody else there. Of course, the one young man that did not fear was David. And David was astonished that everyone would just 
allow this Philistine giant to drag the name of God in the mud? And was it naivete? Was it the change in body chemistry that David was going through that caused him to be so defiant? Was it simply that he was just a hot-tempered young man looking for a fight? Whatever drew David into the battle, the only person that thought David could win was David. And the only one casting his lot in with David was God. Often when we give the sense of this story and try to make our own inter or interpretation, we like to put ourselves in the place of David. But when we do that, we, we really miss the point. If we do that in a proper way, then what we need to see is how weak we are and how much we need the Lord. We're not going to be able to do anything of substance without Him. Because God uses the weak things in this world to confound the wise, and we are weak. But as we learned in Bible school, He is strong. God is strong. And often, those who are weak are used by God are also those who are humble before Him. For all of David's bravado in the situation, he was the only one willing to stand up and fight for the God of Israel. David was humble where it counted. David was a young boy who loved God. He had a heart for God, and God had chosen him. On the other hand, Saul, the man of the people's own choosing, remember the people wanted a king to rule over them, and God did anoint Saul, but Saul is not God's man. Saul was passed over for David. He was not humble before the Lord. Instead, he and the armies of Israel got humbled by watching this little shepherd boy go out and win a battle fit for a king. All of Israel watched little David kill the giant with a sling and a stone. I'm not sure how humble pie tasted on that day, but I guarantee you it tasted bitter. And there was another significant player in all this too. That was Goliath. Goliath was the biggest blowhard of them all. Goliath had won victory after victory after victory for years and years upon end. He stood and taunted the people of Israel and their God. Now here comes this handsome little shepherd boy, this little musician and hymn writer. He comes before the giant. Goliath thought to himself, I've won battle after battle after battle. This one will be a cakewalk. But Goliath was humbled before God and everyone present. It's better to be humble than to be humbled. God humbles those who believe in their own power to succeed without him. God humbled Saul, he humbled Israel, he humbled Goliath. In contrast, God looks on the humble with favor. Are you humble? We are living in a culture in which humility is not viewed as an asset, it's viewed as a detriment. Humility is not a virtue in our culture. But it should be a virtue that is among God's people. Humility should be in vogue in all times, in all places, among the people of God. Are you walking in humility today? See, God gives grace to the humble, and the humble, they glorify God, and God could have used the armies of Israel destroy Goliath and the armies of the Philistines. 
God could have used his army to defeat those people. He had done it before countless times. No one would have been surprised by that. The leadership, including Saul, would have gotten the glory for the victory. Saul himself could have been used by God as a catalyst for this great win. Saul was a big man. He was king in Israel and he was physically op opposing. He was head and shoulders above the rest in Israel. If Saul had instilled confidence in his men and defeated Goliath, no one would have been surprised. But God chose David to win the victory. The little shepherd boy from Bethlehem. Jesse's youngest son, and everyone was surprised. In our day, it is still surprising that God used David. God used David because he knew who would get the glory for the victory. David was willing to glorify God, and God displayed his glory in David. God displays his power in those who bring glory to him. That's my main point this morning. That's exactly what God does. And that's exactly what is illustrated in this very story. God displays his power in those who bring glory to him. During his encounter with Goliath, David answered and announced why he was willing to stand and fight. He said that all the earth would know that there is a God in Israel. They was there to glorify God. Yes, David was a hothead. Yes, David was spurning for a fight, but David loved God and God loved David. God used the humble shepherd boy so that there would be no doubt who won this victory. The battle is the Lord's and the Lord was the victor. David is a significant feature in the story. But the story, it's not about David. David did, of course, benefit greatly from this victory. Fabulous prizes of riches and wealth were eventually given to David. David gained a bride and married Saul's daughter, Michael. Michael loved David, although that would change later. David earned a close friend in Saul's son, Jonathan. David became rich and famous in all of Israel. We know he became king. Songs were sung about him. But there was a price for victory. Saul became resentful and hunted David down like a dog. The story is not about David. David's not the story. David just believed in the one who was the story. By the way, too, we aren't the story. Not everything is always about us. We should just simply believe in the one who is the big deal, the one who the story really is about, and that one is God. The story is not about Goliath either. Goliath is a massive figure both physically and literally. Goliath is imposing but we need not to make Goliath larger than he actually is or to make him represent something that he doesn't. Goliath is an obstacle, but he's also a person. He stands in opposition to God and the people of God. But it is God who removes this uncircumcised Philistine. Goliath is a pawn in the hand of someone more awesome and powerful than he is. God is in control. And no matter how giant Goliath was, he was no match for the living God. God killed the opposition. Goliath was dead, and that was the end of the Goliath. Goliath thought he was a story. He believed that he would have the victory. But we all know the story did not end well for Goliath. We must learn that if we stand in opposition to the living God, then we are in for a rude awakening. 
You can only disparage God's holy name for long enough before you become a casualty in the overall victory. The story is not about David. The story is not about Goliath. The story is not about us. The story is about God. God was at work in the lives of everyone in that battle. Remarkably, God was working in the lives of both David and Goliath. God raised Goliath up. God made him a giant. God made him a warrior. God gave him victories. God made him an almost invincible foe. God made David. God chose David. God made David a shepherd. God gave David practice with sling and stone in the wilderness against lions and bears. God set these two on a collision course. But God is the one who empowered David to defeat Goliath. God is the reason that we know about this story at all. This story is written down in God's book so that we would know what he did. God is the one for whose glory this happened. The plan was set, executed, and completed by God. Why? The story is meant to teach us something. The story is meant to teach us about God. And we are to respond to the truth concerning him that is revealed in this story. If God can control this situation and circumstance, then why should we be afraid about anything? The reason that little David was not fearful of going into battle against such a foe as Goliath was that he knew that the God of Israel was more power than any force or man. How much more should we, as followers of the living God, live without fear? We have the living God living inside of us, and this is something that David himself did not even experience. We know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we must live for the glory of God no matter the opposition or obstacle. And when we live a life for the glory of God, then we experience victory. Just make sure you are fighting for him and not against him. Of course, the greatest battle that any man, woman, or child will ever face is the battle against sin and the wages of sin, which is death. But for us, that battle was won long ago, right? That battle was won on the cross. That battle was won through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And all we must do is come into repentance and faith, believing in Jesus Christ and Him alone to save us. And we can have victory and live in it. And for us who long ago said yes to Jesus Christ, who had that Battle won. The greatest battle that will ever be fought, already fought and won. If the greatest battle is over, then all these other battles that we face are no match for God. Live in victory and know that the battle is the Lord's. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the battle has been won. We thank you that unnumbered foes have come up against you and you have always won. Father, we thank you for the fact that we can have victory in you. We need not put ourselves in the story because we are living our own story and you are giving us the power to overcome. Father, if there is one here today that is not living in victory, that has not said yes to Jesus Christ, draw them to you 
bring them to a place of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Have them to submit to your Lordship today. Father, for all of us out here who long ago said yes to Jesus, help us remember the greatest battle has already been fought. It's already been won through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Help us to know that you give power to those who bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.